A very warm welcome to this CGIR staff webinar. Uh, we appreciate that some of you are connecting quite early in the morning as I am or quite late wherever you are. Unfortunately, we were not able to offer multiple time slots this time, given the number of speakers who are, enjoy, uh, who are joining us from across the world. So if you wish to hear this, this session in Spanish or French, please press the interpretation button at the bottom of your screen, uh, French or English. Um, couldn't be, Ellen and I are very excited to be joined today by members of our one CGR leadership team namely the directors general of centers and alliances in their new positions as global directors. Um, what we have, uh, what we will be doing at various points today is asking these colleagues to introduce themselves or to reintroduce themselves to you and reflect on their new roles and priorities and help us to answer some of your questions about the transition. As always, we've received lots of questions in advance of this session. We thank you for that. And we provide, uh, as we provide our updates, we will try to address as many of those pre-provided uh, questions as possible. You will again have the option to submit additional questions live via the Q&A function at the bottom of your, screen, as, of your screen. We tried this last time, if you remember, and if you wish to ask a question on camera, rather than in writing, please just add the words on camera as you type in your questions. Will then bring you in and enable your camera and microphone, trying to accommodate as many of you as we possibly can. Today's session is being recorded and the recording will be made available on the CGR website within the coming days for any colleagues who were not able to attend and join us today in person. If you encounter any difficulties technically within the, uh, during the webinar process itself, please just write to events E-V-E-N-T-S, events at cgir.org. But before we say more, let's start with a poll. If you recall our Menti polls, uh, we can all introduce ourselves and uh, learn a little bit more about who is connecting today. So the qu question for today's Menti poll is, what is your current role in CGIR? So on screen, you will see the address, www.menti.com and a six digit code to enter when you get to that website on your computer or on your phone. So please type in the address and the code and provide us with your answer. And let us see who we have online today. So we have a tremendous, uh, tremendous range of colleagues with us today. That's wonderful. And that should lead to a very interesting set of discussions here. So let me turn then to how we plan to run today's webinar. First, um, and maybe we'll go now to the, yes, the agenda slide. I will hand it over to Elwyn for an important update on, the, on COVID-19, as well as the key transition processes and milestones to date. After that, I'll introduce the leadership of our research delivery and innovation division and provide a brief update on the key next steps, particularly with regard to the CGAR initiatives. I'll then hand over to Kundavi uh, to similarly introduce the global and regional directors and global engagement and innovation division leaders. And within each of these three segments, we will have set aside time to answer your questions, both ones we received in advance as well as qu uh, questions that are coming in live. Toward the end of today's session, we have a two hour session today, we've reserved some space for discussion on anything else that's on your mind that we haven't covered up to that point. As a reminder, please do signal through the Q&A function on Zoom at the bottom of your screen if you wish to come in and ask your question on camera live. But let me turn now to Ellen to update us on COVID and the transition process so far. Thank you to Ellen now. Thank you, Claudia. Um, I'm not in a great bandwidth area, so do say if this is not very clear and I can turn my video off. Um, okay, two big subjects, and um, we really want to allow time for the many excellent uh, new leaders um, of the operational structure to speak, so I'll be, I'll be, uh, I'll be brief. On the COVID-19 situation, just wanted to share, because we haven't raised it so much in these meetings, you know, how much 
this is on the forefront of, I think, everybody's minds right now, including in the leadership. We had a good discussion and update on it with the system board who are tracking this very closely um, right now. Um, there's um, our senses that uh, this is still deeply impacting staff across the system, across the CJR. Um, the situation is incredibly fluid. We actually are doing a risk tracking right now of, of countries based on uh, the number of uh, the change in number of cases, but also the number of CJR staff. And it's just changing very often, very fluid. So while some countries are going through uh, another phase, others are winding down and hopefully not going into another phase in the future. So we're tracking this. Um, the, uh, we, we understand that uh, about 500 staff have actually contracted COVID um, um, since we started tracking this. And, and very sadly, seven have, have died so far. Um, and, and that we, we deeply regret. Obviously, many are also impacted by um, situation with their families by 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 difficult situations where they are working from home from social isolation there's a whole raft of things that are happening to us as we go through this major transition um, a, a real uh, key aspect is access to vaccines we don't have uh, data on that we understand that this is still a major problem for staff in in, in many of our countries there are good examples, particularly um, thinking of Ilri facilitating access to vaccines in Ethiopia and, and some other uh, cases where staff are being vaccinated. But this appears to be uh, and is a major priority. We have good coordination systems within centres and now across centres. There is um, crisis response teams active within centres. There is a, a centre COVID focal point network. And we've also set up a country um, COVID coordinator um, to make sure that where there are a number of centres in countries that we're, that we're coordinating uh, uh, at, the, at the country level, particularly with respect to access to vaccines. And that seems to be where there's most added value for coordination, not to duplicate anything the centres are doing, um, but it seems that if we are going to get access to vaccines, it needs to be something that we, we push for collectively at the country level there are not global schemes that we're able to access. And we did look, including at the UN schemes. Um, uh, all staff, of course, have access to counseling services and we would, we would really encourage that. And we do look forward to a time, this is a, a pathway to my next, next agenda item, where we have an operational structure, which, which we think will be um, uh, really good at, at helping us coordinate in situations like this. Okay, next item was on a quick update on the operational structure discussion uh, uh, changes. Um, where are we on the journey so far? Well, it's almost exactly mid-year um, and I'd just like to make three main points. Um, this is about how we're creating one CGIR. The first is to recognize we're in a, just an incredibly challenging moment. And, I, and we, you know, EMT and our colleagues really wanna recognize this. This is not an easy change. It's not an easy time to be doing this change. Um, and you know, it doesn't feel good for many of for, for many staff involved. The uncertainty is, is particularly, I think, challenging um, for, for many staff. We're doing our utmost to communicate as best we can through many, many different ways. And, and we want to get even better at that. And we're doing our utmost to make the changes as transparently, fairly, but also swiftly as possible to avoid this uncertainty stretching out for, for too long. Um, so, you know, it's there's we have a, in a sense a combination of high uncertainty and high workloads that are that are necessary part of how we make this change to also reduce the uncertainty because we can't bring external consultants in to do, excuse me, to do all of this change for us. We need to we need to do it ourselves. And, and that's leading to a lot of of uh, challenging workloads. I'd say where we're at in this change and there are many change profiles that organizations used and, and and with thanks to those that have filled out this survey um, that there is a sort of a period of status quo to disruption to exploration to rebuilding that is very much aligned with sort of a shock and denial feelings of shock and denial anger and fear acceptance and then commitment and i sense we're still very much in in the middle of that curve and certainly welcome suggestions from colleagues about how we can how we can do better to make sure that we're, you know, we're doing our very best to 
to minimize the, the, the understandable uncertainty. So that's the first point. The second point is that said, we're actually collectively doing really well. We, um, in the first half of this year, we, we agreed on an operational structure um, with strong endorsement from our, from our funders and our council, um, but also our system board. We have an investment prospectus that's been agreed with also strong endorsement. We have a transition approach um, that's been agreed and, and set up with an initial change management structure. We've stepped up our communications. So we've just, and a number of other things. So we're really achieving a lot. And, and, and that's well recognized by, by our, our system board and our council. The third point is we still got a lot of ahead of us. Um, we have a very critical six months uh, coming up um, for the remainder of this year. We, um, by August, we aim to communicate um, an initial um, uh, individual affiliations by, of all CJR staff to one CJR global groups and regional groups. The purpose of the affiliation exercise is really twofold. First is to clearly communicate that all CJR colleagues have an initial institutional home as a group in the new structure, whether it's a, uh, one of the 10 global groups or one of the, the six regional groups. Um, and it's not necessarily a final destination, staff will move around, but it's a starting point as we continue to integrate our structure and functions across CJR. The second reason for the affiliation is to give one CJR leadership an opportunity to get to know who's in that initial cluster of staff, to have conversations with you all, to start collectively working, to build that new group and to consult on the building of, of that new group. Um, it, it, the affiliation exercise is not it's, it's not going to lead directly to changes of reporting lines or day-to-day -day responsibilities, although we will be managing that process as we go forward. Um, and, and colleagues will, of course, have an opportunity to raise questions and concerns, express and preferences um, um, to be considered as, as, as we go through this process, as, particularly as we go through the, any changes to roles or reporting lines in the future. So that's one key thing that we'd like to get done by, by August. Um, we are also continuing the process of managerial appointments. Um, we, um, we're going through the third phase of that, of that now. We, we've made great progress with um, global director roles. Um, we, uh, as you'll see on this call, we're also in the final stages of interviewing uh, for remaining um, unfilled global and regional director roles. And we're now just putting together our plans for how to fill remaining high number of, of senior director um, positions and, and working with our system board and, and colleagues about how to do that, recognizing that um, there's a really important, um, there's a really important position. So we need to get the best possible people. And we also need that, that group to, to represent the world as it is with, a, with, a di with, with, with its diversity in terms of gender, um, uh, race and, and all ethnicity, race, uh, mobility, age, and other factors. Um, and last thing I'll say on, on this subject is following the initial affiliations, um, and we are anticipating governance um, decisions to enable uh, and empower the new leadership. Um, we're going to be working through a process um, um, starting in September to assign staff to roles in a new structure and shifting reporting lines, principally at that, that senior level of staff, so that there's at least initially, those global directors have, have all staff reporting um, into them over time. And that, that's gonna be an incremental, that's gonna be an incremental process. We, we, we do aspire that at the end of this year, um, we will have in place an operating model ready to, to launch the science groups and to serve them, um, and, and, and that will require a number of, of, of things to be got right, an initial operating budget, some initial HR policies, initial management systems, recognizing that we're not gonna do everything by the 1st of January. We just need to do the minimum for that structure to work and be in place and then carry on building, um, build, building our, 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 our system, excuse me. So, um, a quick update, not so quick, there's a lot going on. Um, Claudia, shall I quickly touch on the two areas where there were questions or am I running over time in your hands? You are right on time and please do. Oh, good. Um, all right, so there were two, uh, thanks so much for colleagues for, for submitting questions in advance. We, we really appreciate this. Um, 
questions fell into two broad areas, contract renewals and, um, and salary structure and, 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 and related HR policies. And what I would say on this is, this is not our last discussion on these items. This is the first of many. Um, what we hope to do in an upcoming uh, all staff webinar is when we have the four institutional strategy and systems global directors in place, we can have them on the call and go into a deeper discussion of, of many of these aspects. So, so really very briefly um, on, um, on contract renewals and, and with thanks to uh, Mohammed, Victor, Linda and others for raising questions on this. Um, um, the, look, a few points I wanted to make. Um, the, um, the first is that one of the reasons, one of the benefits of doing one CJR is that it will, or we, we have a strong sense that this will give us a much more secure funding future. Um, and which has a direct link into the probability of contract renewal. So it's just a very general point that all the indication from our funders are that if we hadn't done this, um, we would have been in a very difficult place, not just for pooled money, but, but also bilateral and when, what we call window three, but bilateral projects. And that by doing it, we're really earning more and more of the trust and continued support of our principal funders. That's the general point that, that I wanted to make. On uh, the, uh, the question around, you know, what are our processes for renewals? Um, uh, what will happen to contracts coming up for renewal? We have said, and we continue to say that we are building one CJR um, for a more positive future where we have even enhanced funding. So we're gonna need the skills we've got in one CJR and we're gonna to need to keep hold of those skills. Um, and we're gonna to need to repurpose those skills through the, the affiliation, but particularly through the, um, the staff reporting changes that, that, that will be happening over the course of this year. So we are working with the leadership team um, um, on taking a closer look at the number of contracts coming up for renewal, having discussion about the risks of losing key talent, managing this and tracking it uh, very closely. Our contract renewals data for January to June 2021 does not suggest um, a significant increase in, ch in, in, in or change in turnover, what we call churn rates, which gives us some some assurance, but we need to carry on watching this closely. Um, from what we see of the HR data historically, there does seem to be a healthy amount of staff continuity in, in, in CJR, which isn't to say that there are exceptions and during the transition, um, a key priority, as I said, is for us to provide clarity as soon and as quickly as possible as we can to, to staff. Um, um, and, and that's through the assignments process as we build these, these, these global and regional groups. One thing that we are is an organization of CJR, a set of organizations that, that relies on programmatic funding. The days of when we could have what we called core institutional funding as the majority of our funding, which made it much easier to long-term plan and long-term um, uh, manage staff contracts um, uh, are, are gone. And we're going to have to manage this where there is a link between funding and, and, and the, science, the, the requirements for our science skills. But we now have a 10 year research strategy. We now have an investment prospectus and it's building heavily on the, on the kind of skills that, that we have in CJR and need to expand in some areas. So I do see some continuity in that process. So just a few general points on, on, uh, on contract renewals, on salary structure and related HR policies. Um, a key priority for the next six months is to complete the, the work for an early stage. Oh, sorry, I'm being interrupted by my kids here. I'm on a call, Spencer, give me five minutes. Um, can you come with us yeah, yeah, in a moment. No, 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 wait. <laughs> Sorry, it's school holidays. God, you've got a taste of uh, my personal life there. Um, so um, on, um, as, as, as I mentioned earlier, we need to work through our HR policies. Um, and, and that's going to be something we need to do over the next six months. Um, we need to um, put in place some early stage operating model policies for us to get up and running for next year. But there's a whole raft of HR policies, whether it's um, diversity of, of compensation between centers, differences in, in our host agreements um, that we're gonna need to work through together, but that doesn't need to be done by the end of this year. It needs to be something that we work through as we develop our longer run HR policy framework, which is something that we're targeting for 
when we have an HR global director and team in place to sort of build up over time. So um, uh, with that, back to you, Claudia. Thanks, Elwin. And, and let me point out that Elwin is actually on leave today and uh, joining us uh, from, from, from that moment. Uh, I hope that this example is not followed by any of you. Everyone really does need to take a break. These are difficult times, but I'm very grateful, Elwin, that you've joined us today despite uh, being on leave. We have a few questions coming in on the Q&A. Um, uh, there's several people asking about when the announcements will be made for the appointments of ISNS and GENI uh, leadership. That's the institutional systems and the global engagement and innovation. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that time frame. And then a couple of people asking about whether the update you've just given implies that centers will ultimately disappear. Maybe you can speak to those two questions. Got it. The, 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 the first question on ISNS appointments, we are nearly at the end of that process. We hope to make announcements either late this week or I certainly hope next week. Um, with thanks for uh, many of those who, who were engaged in that process. On um, the global engagement positions, Pat Kundavi, you could give a quick update on that and then I'll come back to the center question. Okay, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll give a... Um, my understanding of this is that we are pretty near the finalization of that process. Two interviews have taken place for the three global directors in, in global engagement and also um, midway through the process. Interrupt, Kundavi, if your sound is okay. working. <laughs> ah, you are there. Okay. Over to you. Okay. And just from the global engagement positions, um, the one on uh, resource mobilization and innovative financing and also with respect to the communication and advocacy position. The interviews have been completed. We are in the process of uh, finalizing. So hopefully in the coming weeks, more sooner than later in the next two, two, three weeks, we'll be able to make a decision and come back to you. The ones relating to regional directors is just getting underway. So the interviews haven't started, but we hope in the next uh, two weeks, we'll be able to complete the interviews and then be able to make some final decisions sometime before end of July. That's the plan. Back to you. Um, so, so the good thing about all this is that in really a matter of weeks, we're going to be able to um, announce the complete global and regional director leadership team um, and then quickly get into hiring the, the remaining senior director positions that are that need to be filled so that those global and regional directors um, have teams supporting them and that they can be empowered to, to take the agenda forward. On the future of centers, it's, um, look, the, the capabilities of centers are, are the fundamental building blocks of, of one CGIR. So centers um, and the spirit of, 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 of centers, you know, will be will run right through this operational structure. I could see, uh, for example, a center being a thriving campus where a number of staff are based, where we continue to benefit from the host agreement. Uh, we continue to benefit from the excellent facilities that have been built. We continue to benefit from the brand name where that makes sense to use for fundraising. Um, but we have a decision-making structure which isn't anchored around the traditional center model with a, an independent center with its own, all it, it, entirely its own policies, with its own internal decision-making structure, because we felt that that was not helping CJR move forward to develop integrated solutions and to develop the most, uh, you know, the best quality uh, corporate services and, and the best quality fundraising and communications. So, um, you know, what we try to describe, in, and, and it is a complicated thing to describe, but what we try to describe in, in the various communications around this is that the centers transition from being standalone, independent organizations, which entirely you know, functioning as, as one integrated entity to the, the, the component elements of an organizational structure where the operational structure does not, is not organized uh, by definition around traditional center lines. Uh, for, the, for the many reasons we've discussed in previous calls of that wasn't really helping us move forward. Um, so that, uh, we could have a much longer discussion around that, Claudia, but, but perhaps back to you. Very good. 
Okay, we have a bunch of questions um, around the relationship between regional directors and uh, science groups. I'd suggest that we manage that as we move into the, uh, the discussion of uh, global engagement. So perhaps going to be when you open the session discussing, discussing and introducing the regional directors, you can speak a bit to that because we want to move through our program, which is very full for today. Several issues have been answered in the answer section of the Q&A online, and we will continue to, to capture and try to speak to the questions that all of you have raised uh, today. But we want to move on now to the second uh, item on our agenda, which is the introduction of the global and senior directors, uh, first in the research delivery and impact division, the science division. So as you know, within the science division, we have uh, several new structures, including the three science groups, primarily the three science groups, systems transformation, resilient agri-food systems, and genetic innovations. Cutting across those science groups, we will have our five impact area platforms corresponding to the five impact areas of our research and innovation strategy on hunger, poverty, climate, gender, and environment. And we'll also have within the uh, research delivery and impact is it division a cross cutting project coordination, monitoring and performance management unit. We have task forces working on the structure of that unit now as well. So this global team in these new structures will lead the delivery of all of one CGR research beginning in 2022. Some of the key priorities for this team over the transition year of 2021, which we are halfway through now, as Ellen has mentioned, will include completing the designs of the CGIR initiatives for pooled funding. Uh, recall or let us tell you that the System Council uh, met in June and approved the 2022 to 2024 investment prospectus, which is essentially the set of initiatives that arguably will be the next generation of the CRPs. Uh, this science leadership team will review and finalize the operational structure for the research delivery and, uh, and uh, impact division. They will also engage in the remaining senior appointments process, and they will work to develop the essential policies and systems that will enable us to deliver the outstanding science of one CGIR. So let us use this segment now to introduce uh, in their new functions, but reintroduce to you uh, the new uh, leadership appointments for the science division. We have six, uh, six outstanding scientists and individuals whom you all know. We have uh, Barbara Wells, who will be the Global Director of Genetic Innovation, as you know her, the DG of SIP, Gareth Johnstone, the Senior Director for Aquatic Food Systems, as you know him, the DG of World Fish, Jimmy Smith, the Senior Director of Livestock-Based Systems, and DG Ellery, Yoan Swinnan, the Global Director for Systems Transformation, DG IFPRI, Mark Smith, Senior Director of Water Systems, DG IMI, and Martin Croft, Global Director for Resilient Agri-Food Systems, currently DG CIMET. So uh, we, will, we will move forward in that uh, alphabetical by first name order. And let me turn first then to Barbara Wells, the Global Director for Genetic Innovation. Barbara, please. Well, thank you very much, Claudia. And a special thank you for all the staff across the globe who have joined us for this meeting. Um, I just wanted to share with you a little bit about my position and the responsibilities that lie within it and also to share with you how truly excited I am and what it is about my role that is exciting that should really energize many, many of us as we look um, into the future. So my position as Global Science Director for Genetic Innovation, I'm responsible for what is unarguably only after our staff, unarguably one of our most valued assets in the system the germplasm and gene banks. I'm responsible for the breeding programs across centers that have been somewhat coordinated to date by the Crops to End Hunger Funder um, Breeding Group, the Breeding Services or Excellence in Breeding that has also been brought together under tremendous leadership already within the system. 
precision crop improvement tools like gene editing and biotechnology. We have formalized our seed delivery system, uh, market intelligence, of which we've talked a lot about to really feed into what varieties we should be working on together with uh, connecting farmer demand uh, and processor demand with those uh, products that we work on. And of course, gene banks, which we have always spoken to as the family jewels or the, or the crown jewels, if you will, of the system. What I find really exciting about this position and actually the stage which we are in, in developing the 1CG is that we're finally working together as one, which we should, it's so critical that we do that. Coordinating what we do in genetic innovations with resilient agri-food systems and with systems transformation, but critically also connecting everything with we, which we do with the regions and countries and what is being demanded by the regions and countries. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges we have is this transition uh, that, that Elwin spoke to. We're in this critical component at the moment that is we have our plates completely full. We're working on initiatives. We're working on bringing the teams together. But I know that as we go through this and work through, through it all together, we're going to uh, come out in a very cohesive and uh, one system supporting one another rather than in looking at how we survive uh, while others do not. This is how we bring everything together for our beneficiaries. So remember, we're in this business for our beneficiaries. Thank you very much, Claudia, and um, everyone for the opportunity to share with you my thoughts. Thank you so much, Barbara, and a very important reminder here uh, about why we do what we do and why we go through these uh, processes of, of improvement and renewal is really for our stakeholders. Moving on then to Gareth, Gareth Johnstone, newly appointed Senior Director for Aquatic Food Systems. Hi everybody and thanks Claudia. Um, thanks for the chance to uh, explain a little bit about this new role, <coughs> Senior Director of Aquatic Food Systems. Um, it actually includes the other hat. I do wear two hats, the DG of World Fish continues and the Senior Director of Aquatic Food Systems. So in many respects, as DG it provides valuable continuity at the entity level. So particularly through the transition period, ensuring that we connect across core functions, business development, partners, communications, et cetera, et cetera. But as a senior director of credit food systems, it builds on and provides, or well, my role is to provide the strategic oversight, guidance, and management of aquatic foods. If you're wondering what aquatic foods are, well, this is moving further on from the uh, idea of fish to fish, including both animals, plants, microorganisms that are farmed in and harvested from water, as well as cell and plant-based foods emerging from, two net techno uh, from new technologies. This is an ex a fast growing, uh, potentially really exciting area for CGIR. So as a senior director for Aquatic Food Systems, I will be working as we have done and building on our legacy to look at the synergies with other scientific and innovation disciplines across one CGIR. And this has been reflected in the uh, operational structure that Alvin referred to. So we have uh, most, if not all of the Aquatic Food Systems sits within the Resilient Agri-Food Systems Science Group. So in many respects that means that all our work is uh, focused around the, 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 that science group. We will obviously connect with the work of transformational change and, and, and where possible genetic innovation uh, as part and parcel of the role that we, we play and bring to one CDR. So we will continue and exciting to see the, in the operational structure that aquatic food sits alongside crops, livestock, and really therefore looking forward to building on that um, uh, work that we have done already you know, around nutrition, public health, ensure CGI expertise in aquatic food systems is enhanced and the potential opportunities are really explored. I mean, um, I think the last, if you're going to look at it, the, the focus of agricultural research agenda of the last 50 years, including CGIR, is predominantly based on, on land-based production systems and livestock. And so, 
we believe very strongly, and I believe very strongly, the next 50 years, of quite a few systems will play a greater role. Uh, and I really welcome the new mission to transform land, food, and water systems. It's critically important that aquatic foods can support that. And I, I, I strongly believe that you cannot have a food system transformation without aquatic foods. So where there's water, there is fish. And so every initiative potentially can have a component of aquatic foods that enhances both the uh, potential nutrition lab value, but also in terms of uh, climate change resilience. Um, in, in terms of growing that. So we've learned a lot of lessons of the green revolution in the past, and I think that can help and shape and form the blue revolution in aquatic foods. And so I really look forward to working with my colleagues and exploring what we can do uh, in this exciting new area in one CGR. Over to you. Thanks so much, Gareth. And I really appreciate the way you have tied this new structure and this construct of aquatic foods right back to the research and innovation strategy. Again, this is this is what we're after. I see some of the questions, for example, in the chat asking about uh, the relationship of bilateral projects to uh, the performance and results management framework and the research and innovation strategy. Everything that one CGIR will do, bilateral, pooled, funded, whatever the funding source, will all be working toward the mandate of this transformation of food, land, and water systems in a climate crisis, our mission, and our research and innovation strategy. So thank you for pulling uh, that, that broad theme right into perspective. Um, we'll move now to Jimmy Smith, our Senior Director for Livestock-Based Systems. Jimmy, please. Thank you, Claudia. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all joining this call. I'm delighted to have an opportunity to say a few words to you today. As I was thinking about what I could or should say today, I couldn't help reflecting on the fact that for most of the 50 years of the CGIAR, it has been pursuing this quest of making the whole greater than the sum of the parts. Many things have been tried, programmatically, administratively, but now we're trying the whole hog. Governance, organizational change and programmatic change. We have eventually landed, I hope, on the one CGIR that has been elusive all these years. So what do I see in my role as contributing to this endeavor? There are some things specific to what I could do or should be doing, but there are things that I'll be working with many others to do. What first is that we, we want to make the whole CGIAR greater than the sum of the parts. And therefore, in this one CGIAR construct, we hope that there will many, be many direct dimensions of, of scale and making the whole better, more efficient and more effective. I'll be working with others to improve the heft of the CG as a global player. That is, of course, very important. Specifically, I will be hoping to work with Garrett and others to make animal source foods a bigger part of the CGIAR. It has been part of the Cinderella of the CGIAR for many years. Combined fish and animals make up 50% of agriculture. And I would like these to be a much more prominent part of, of, of the agenda. So I'll be working with many to try to do this. I know that many are concerned about funding and other things like that. Those are traditional uh, concerns in, in the CGIR that will never go away. So I am hopeful about the benefits, but the challenges that I'm asked to reflect on, I see as the challenge of being a big organization, but not becoming bureaucratic. A few nights ago, the president of the African Development Bank was in a meeting with the Minister of Finance in Uganda, learned about a foot and mouth outbreak in Uganda. He called me on the phone and by the next morning, our staff were, were, talk, were speaking with Ugandan officials about how we could help. I hope that nimbleness will continue. And in the new um, modalities of the CGIR, we will not become overly bureaucratic. I hope that we will learn from our 50 years and not reinvent every wheel. So 
I was asked to speak about opportunities and challenges, many opportunities I see, some challenges, but all of them, I think, if we work together, we could surmount. So thank you, Claudia. Thanks so much, Jimmy. Um, very important points about how we, uh, how we create our own future and how we create our new institution. I think one of the other really challenging and essential issues that Jimmy will be leading on is One Health which uh, goes without saying is an increasingly uh, urgent concern for all of us. So very much looking forward to the evolution of this new uh, division that Jimmy will be heading. We'll move on then to Yoan Swinnen, the Global Director for Systems Transformation. Yo, please. Hi, Claudia, thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I was, uh, when I was trying to prepare my short introduction, I was reflecting, going through the process, and I saw as many people spoke in front of me already, which I thought would mention several things I wouldn't normally say if I would be on my own. And that was indeed true. Let me just uh, reflect on a, on a couple of points, maybe, that have not been mentioned. The, uh, I'm actually relatively new to the CG system. I started in January 2020 as Director General of IFPRI. And I must say a lot of things or most of what I've done since then was not in my TORs and including becoming a global director was not in my TORs needed. So expecting unexpected has been a bit the light motive uh, since I have joined the CGIR uh, now a year and a half ago. That said, I'm really excited to lead the systems transformation group. There is a lot of innovations to be done. We also have the challenge to really make the case that the one CGIR is different from the CGIR. I mean, that's true for all the science group, but there's a little bit more emphasis on this, I think, in, in our group. Uh, needless to say that I am, I really believe that policy and global systems change are crucial for making the world a better place, for making the transformation possible that we all need. We know that a lot of indicators in the world where we are working on actually going in the wrong direction, think about uh, hunger, malnutrition, uh, sustainability, etc., uh, poverty, and this was already before COVID-19. COVID-19 has made these things worse. So the whole transformation of the whole system, not just including the food system, but also the land and water system, I think are, are really crucial, crucial things to work on. In terms of the process, it's a bit like jumping on a, trying to jump on a running train, because a lot of things were already in motion by the time that, that we started. At the same time, we're trying to get a good feeling about how the train is running, getting to the right uh, station, obviously. I think we're working well together, both within our uh, emerging structure, if you want, of, of the system transformation group. We have a week, tw uh, two weekly meetings now, sorry, two meetings a week to be provided, and also with the other um, science leaders, particularly with Barbara and Martin, we meet at least one time a week just to make sure that we are in line with a number of the issues that are, are coming ahead. Uh, Claudia and Elwin both already mentioned the, the reception, the positive reception uh, by the board and the council of the investment prospectus. There's a lot of work to be done, but at least the big lines were very strongly endorsed there. The um, Then in terms of the challenges, I mean, I don't really have to explain the challenges to you. I think that there's a lot of them. We're facing them day to day, but also going forward, what's happening. The transition uh, challenges are immense. At the same time, it is a very, very ambitious goal that we set ourselves, and I think that's, that's very good as well. In any case, I see there's, there's a really important role to play for us as leadership, but also for you. And so you are leading your own teams, your own groups, and you are contributing to the changes. And there's no way we can get this thing done top down. We have to do this together um, at all levels of, of the system. It requires engagement, skills, creativity, innovative ideas at all levels and commitment to make this happen. And I look forward to working with all of you on this. Thank you. Thanks so much, Yo. And let me just uh, reinforce the last point that you made there, which is that each one of us has a role in bringing together our teams, our colleagues, um, into understanding the reform process that we're in and to making this new structure really thrive. And I think what I'm seeing it very strongly with the, the new leadership appointments um, and uh, I believe throughout the system with our communities of practice, our working groups, our task forces, so many of you who are really putting your, your heart, your effort into this transition. Let's move now to Mark Smith, our Senior Director for Water Systems. Mark, please. Uh, thank you, Claudia. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, like the others in preparing these remarks, I, um, 
I, I was reflecting back on why am I here? Why am I why am I um, engaged in this great transformation transition process for one CGIR? And and I, and I think it's it's critical to to recognize that the reason it's worth doing is that one CGIR has such huge potential for impact on some of the biggest challenges that, that we're facing in the world. Indeed, that, that our generations, I guess, are facing. And I'm really proud to be part of that effort. And you know, when this system flexes its muscles, when we bring together our, our intellectual and our uh, innovation and partnership muscle, we will help catalyze change across food, land and water systems like no one else can. No one can match us if we get this right. I firmly believe that. But but this is challenging. You asked us about challenges. And this, this isn't business as usual for CGIR. We have 50 years of history, we all know, and, and 50 years of achievement to build on. Um, but with the state that the world's in, we have to go further than that. And, and it's that challenge that, that really motivates me. Um, how can we use the synergies across the CG system to use science to help tackle complex transformations. So pulling together technologies and government governance and change in institutions with innovations that empower women and catalyze inclusion and getting investment flowing at the scale that's needed for change across food systems, for sustainability of land and water systems and this, and this deep, deep issue, I hope, of, of really achieving radical pro progress in climate change. Um, so my role is as Senior Director for Water Systems, and in this role, I will lead the Water Systems Unit in the Systems Transformation Group. But beyond this, I've also been tasked with, with being one CGR's focal point on water systems research and for coordinating and advocating for water systems management across the CGIR. So you ask, Claudia, one of the questions that was put to us is what, what is it that excites us? Well, that, that's what excites me. There's a huge opportunity here for cooperation across CGIR and uh, on water system science and strategic cohesion in doing that, that we've not had before, which means that I'll be continuing to work with my great colleagues at IMI, as well as with all those working on water systems related topics and innovations in other science groups and in other units. And so building collaboration with them and among them, helping them to do that. And so, as Jimmy said, making the whole greater than the sum of the parts, that's, that's, that's part of what I see as, as our potential too. So I wanna close though with one final point, and, and this is really important. With, with water system science, as we head into, into this, this new endeavor together, I think we, we're gonna to need to renew really our understanding in CGIR of the key scientific challenges that there are for water systems. Because climate change is changing everything for water. It's changing the game for water. Old assumptions about the availability of water, uh, water risks and how to manage them and, and, and where to do what, they're falling away and they're being replaced by what we talk about as deep uncertainty. So water risks and investments and indeed the politics of water, they're a different game in the 21st century than they've been in the past. And for CGIR, this has a lot of implications. Um, and one of those is that our innovations have to be robust across multiple water futures, which is a big challenge for the world. And it, it's a really interesting scientific and development challenge for us too. So I'm very much looking forward as one CGR comes together to working with everyone on, on those big challenges um, as they relate to water systems and as they relate to our, to our, broader, our broader mission. Um, and doing so with colleagues across all three science groups, doing so with uh, colleagues across the different regional groups and country groups. Thank you, Gloria. Thanks so much, Mark. And I really appreciate the, the way you've woven the water issues uh, into uh, not only across the science groups and the different disciplines, but reminding us how the context of climate change uh, in which we now all work um, is something that really impacts the science that needs to be done, the context we need to understand in a way that we have not understood it before. How do we grapple with this tremendous deep uncertainty in everything that we do and in the water systems and the uh, in the effects this will have on our uh, water environments uh, for, for Gareth and our aquatic food systems, the impacts that this will have on human and animal and one health in, in, in Jimmy's groups. Um, it's, a, it's quite a new universe that we're operating in and the need to weave this knowledge across the various uh, aspects of our science has never been greater. And uh, we really hope that this new structure will allow us to do that much more effectively. So thank you, Mark. 
Um, and our final introduction today, our final reintroduction today is Martin Croft, our Global Director for Resilient Agri-Food Systems. Martin, please. Martin, you're muted. I think you're good. Is now. better? Now, here we are. Good. Yeah, the most uh, popular sentence uh, these days, you're muted. Um, so you started with resilient agri-food systems. That's uh, my new role, but maybe we should call it climate resilient agri-food system because climate is really overarching in the whole thing. So um, basically, uh, the, the rough area, as we call it these days, um, is, is very broad. And it, basically, the way I see it is one of the three pillars that we need to build on uh, with science to fulfill our mission, which is basically uh, the supporting of the transformation of food systems for affordable, sufficient and healthy diets produced within planetary boundaries. One sentence, but there's so much in there and we need to work uh, in all the three areas in the genetics, in management, governance policy. Um, so we need all three. You can't solve the problem with only seeds. You can't solve the problem with only policy. You need all three of them. And um, so I'm very happy with uh, this new role. Um, uh, so to coordinate the science and the impact path, because it's special about the CGIR. I don't know any research organization globally that has such an impact from research. So uh, to, with, through our partnerships, I always indicate, because we can't do it on our own. So in the rough area, we go from uh, field farm uh, and fishery uh, to landscape level, you could say. And I'm very happy that we here combine crop sciences, animal sciences, and aquatic food sciences. Um, there's a lot going on globally, uh, a lot of unique activities. And with the five senior directors, uh, we will have to make a team so that we can really build a good agenda. And uh, working already with Jimmy and Garrett, and I hope that we will find three other very good senior directors in that area. And what we already have, and thank you uh, for all those people working on it, a very good set of initiatives, proposals still, and they have to be worked out to full proposals. And we are now full in the evaluation process. So, um, but what is very special also in, in the Ross area, or it's linked to us, and I'm very happy with this, uh, are the um, not just very high level uh, programs, but that we also have integrated regional initiatives, scientific programs. And what's super important, it's not um, uh, high level uh, systems programs uh, where we just talk and all these kind of things. No, these are really programs and we have several good examples of them where the real innovation is done at scale with farmers, uh, with the national system, with all our partnerships, so um, uh, where we uh, uh, reach innovations with sometimes uh, up to 500,000 farmers. And then of course, uh, after that beyond. Um, very interesting also that we are then in the regions uh, working with the global, uh, with the regional directors as well to make sure that we are demand driven. That's also, I think one new thing in the CGR that we are going to be more demand driven than ever. Um, so, um, there are many new elements uh, in the portfolio that we are developing, but we have to also indicate that we are building on solid ground. Uh, it's not that we come completely new, innocent uh, in uh, these new systems. No, there is a solid ground. We have a strong organization uh, and we build those new initiatives on it. And the donors are really committed uh, to work with us as well in those teams. But of course, we all recognize, and my colleague said already, the challenges are enormous. We all know it. The time scale is super short, um, but we have great support teams. I have now in the RAFS area, because all the centers are involved, especially in the integrated programs, we have a high level support team. Uh, from all the centers, there are people in the team that really work together to help the people writing the proposals to do a good job. So um, uh, for me, it's also great to, to focus uh, a bit extra on the science uh, and the impact. Uh, that's what the CG uh, makes it unique. Now, the opportunities of 1CG, my colleagues told already, but I have been a promoter already since 10 years to move to 1CGIR. Uh, in Wageningen, we have been working on uh, merging 39 institutions and a university in a longer time frame, I must say, but uh, the impact of this has been um, enormous. Um, so if we can do something similar, that also we really start working together, uh, then I think uh, we can be a completely different organization five, organization five years from now. But it's challenging, it's uh, not that easy,
but uh, the key is that you get in a cooperation mode and uh, not in an internal competition mode. Um, and Barbara, Jo, and I are meeting very often, but also really moving on and really are on the same page that we want to do it together. But of course, like what others said as well, you have to do it together with all of you. Great to have 880 uh, people online because um, to fulfill this mission, we have to work together. Thank you. Thanks so much, Martin. And um, it's, it's wonderful to recall the experience actually that you did have at Wageningen to see the way in which uh, independent institutions can come together in, uh, in, in a way that really strengthens everyone. And this construct of building on what we have, we have such an extraordinary history and such extraordinary capabilities in the CGIR. Uh, this transition and these reforms we hope will, will build us even stronger for the 50 years ahead. Now we're just about at the end of this segment, but let me pull a couple of very brief questions uh, that have come up. We'll also continue to try to answer questions in the Q&A uh, um, windows. Uh, but uh, let, let me answer two in particular that had come up earlier as well. The uh, question around whether initiatives will be launched at the UN Food System Summit um, this fall and whether they will be actually launched prior to receiving their funding. The, the construct, the expectation is that at the UN Food System Summit, we will be able to announce the initiatives that we intend to launch but the launching of initiatives will take place in January of 2022. Once they are fully funded, we will not make announcements and ahead, uh, we will not launch initiatives um, ahead of uh, January, 2022. We have a number of ongoing initiatives, initiatives that are building. We don't expect there to be any gap in a uh, significant gap in our research programming. We expect a very strong transition into the new portfolio, that there will be discussion of the sets of initiatives at the UN Food System Summit, but the work of those initiatives will begin in January 2022. There was also a question about whether uh, individual scientists could work on more than one initiative, uh, as now they might be working on more than one CRP. And this is a, a good question to help clarify that scientists will be mapped not to initiatives, but to science groups. Just as now you're not mapped to your line manager, maybe a team leader uh, within a center, the, the mapping, the reporting lines will be to science groups or to regional directors, and then you will work on initiatives. You may be working on multiple CG initiatives, you may be working on multiple bilateral projects, but your administrative mapping will be to the global groups, whether that's a global science group or a global uh, institutional systems group or a global engagement group. So the mapping and the assignments uh, might be, would be, would be different uh, for scientists. And that's the way this question was written. You'll map to a global science group, but your work will be on the initiatives and the uh, bilateral programming that your uh, science group director and you decide on uh, that, that best suits your, your uh, uh, skills and interests. We had one other question that quite a lot of people are very interested in, and I'm hoping that Barbara will be able to speak to this, uh, a question about the relationship between the science groups and the crop trust because the gene bank initiative is, yeah, gene bank issue is so central to uh, our heritage and our future. So Barbara, please. Yeah, and thank you for those who posed that question. It is a very critical question. And I guess the way I see it is that the, the relationship with the Global Crop Trust doesn't really change. They are and have always been a funder and a partner uh, in the, Gene Bank and the Gene Bank Network the, uh, that that we um, that our centers hold in trust on behalf of of the uh, the system, but you know they're not our collections, but they're we are an important um, holder of those co collections on behalf of FAO and uh, in public trust. So we do have an evolution of the components of which uh, the Global Crop Trust is 
is funding certain collections at perpetuity once they reach a, a significant um, responsibilities and milestones. But I would also have to say that um, as funders, they, that is the, the mechanism in which they fund. But our funders have always been strong supporters of the um, gene banks. So while, while we sort out you know, what is the total amount that's required to continue to fund the gene banks, what is particularly important is the structure in which we move forward with the gene banks will fall in a very similar model to that which has been done under the platform in the past with some adjustments. Uh, there has been studies to say, how do we uh, make the management of the gene banks and the delivery of um, the collections and the protection of the collections at perpetuity, but also the ability to use the collections more actively um, and bringing that all together in a much more active way. So I see, like everything, challenge of transition but certainly huge commitment um, for the gene banks and a very important component of our overall portfolio going forward. Um, thank you. Thanks very much, Barbara. Um, we, we do have a number, we have lots of questions tumbling in on the Q&A. We will continue to try to answer these, uh, but I do think we need to move on to the next section now, particularly in order to keep some open space at the end of the day. So I would like to hand over to Kundavi to introduce the global and regional directors and also to begin to address some of the issues that we have been seeing in the Q&A about the relationships between regional directors and, uh, and the science groups and how all this will fit together to strengthen us. So over to you, Kundavi. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Claudia. Uh, again, just wanted to say how much is going on now um, uh, in the global engagement. There is uh, a growing recognition of the role of innovation, research, science and policy and food systems transformation. Uh, I already mentioned to you all that the year we got off to a great start where the new strategy was uh, launched at the Global Adaptation Summit. And we have continued to engage very strongly in, in the global uh, stage, really pushing forth the importance and the advocacy on the food, uh, land and water systems, and uh, how one CGAR can contribute to the larger agenda. Uh, more recently, there was a big event, the G7 came together, and as part of that, uh, the G7, is G7 communique that the ministers put forth really underlined the importance of um, national and multinational uh, research institution and in which a, a CGR was also explicitly highlighted. This is the kind of thing that we have really put a lot of energy and effort uh, to put the emphasis on research and innovation uh, in food systems and in the climate agenda. Uh, similarly, another big event more recently was the G20 and I'm very pleased that uh, Juan Lucas who as a, in his role as the Global Director for Partnership and Advocacy represented us very strongly and also made a pitch uh, to the G20, uh, the need for um, investment in research and innovation. You know, this is an area where we have always uh, had a, a difficult time in getting funding in countries uh, from governments, but also in the global stage. So in that sense, uh, the emphasis with respect to science and innovation for finding creative and big solutions was also sort of uh, put forth very strongly, and particularly in, in an area where we are pushing very strongly with respect to food security, but also nutrition security, and therefore making food um, and food uh, being available to the poor. Uh, for, for a better diet. So in that sense, this emphasis at the G20 was also very uh, well received. Now starting uh, this week, Claudia Wilson and several of our leadership team are participating in the science segment of the UN Food System Summit. 
later this month, we will also have the pre-summit coming uh, for the UN Food System Summit. So we will, number of us will be participating and all geared to put some key messages out there. Uh, we'll be sharing uh, with the leadership team uh, some of the key messages so that we can have a one CG effort in these global events. Um, again, we will have the uh, summit in September followed by the COP. So a number of um, exciting en engagement um, uh, in the coming months. So I just wanted to sort of emphasize how uh, we have really put the one CGAR in the map and it also helps us to scale up our ambition significantly. Now, I also wanted to speak a bit about the global engagement and innovation team before I introduce my uh, the, the, the new leadership team within that uh, division. Uh, we already uh, had, um, uh, you know, uh, provided you the sort of a, a operating structure for the global engagement and innovation team. You have, we, we have three gr groups here. We have the resource mobilization and innovative finance uh, group within that division. We have the partnership and advocacy uh, group within that division, and uh, then also the communication outreach. These are the global division within the global engagement innovation team. And then we also have the six regional groups, all enabling us to engage very strongly on the ground as one CGIR. Uh, the priorities of this group, uh, particularly in the next six months, uh, are huge. Uh, the funding aspect of it is so critical to get our um, initiatives uh, kick off on time uh, early next year. And also the advocacy and communication campaign in supporting the portfolio and ensuring that um, the funder support comes on a timely basis. So the aspect relating to CGIRs to bring stability in our funding will be an important element of our work. Now, the other uh, aspects which I also see in the, uh, the chat where you all want to know how does CJR operate at the country and the regional level. And that's a model we are currently sort of working together with the regional directors who have come on board. And therefore, all aspects relating to country managers, uh, the terms of reference for them, the, the criteria for selection, uh, the, the guidelines uh, towards that and the time frame are all being currently worked out. So just wanted to respond to that um, question that came about how, uh, what, what's going on and the, what's the time frame for the uh, country manager uh, selection. This will also be a large responsibility of the regional di directors coming on board. Uh, let me actually take uh, uh, this moment to stop and actually bring my uh, colleagues from the uh, Global Engagement Innovation Team who are taking on their new responsibilities. Uh, as you know, Juan Lucas, uh, the Global Director, will be the Global Director for Partnership and Advocacy. Uh, he's also the, the DG for the Alliance. And we have Ali uh, Abu Sabah, who's, um, who is the Regional Director for Central and West Asia and North Africa, also the DG for ICADA. Uh, Harold Rai Macaulay as the Regional Director of East and Southern Africa for the new one CGIR, who is also the DG for Africa Rice, and Jean Valley, uh, who is the Regional Director, who is, will be the Regional Director for, for South and East Asia and the Pacific. He's also the Acting Regional Director for South Asia until this position is filled. As I already mentioned to you, we are currently in the process of selection of the Regional Director of uh, South Asia and Latin America. And uh, last, I also wanted to uh, introduce uh, Sanginga, who is our Regional Director for West and Central Africa, also our DG for IITA. Now, I will invite uh, my colleagues um, to come and share their uh, thoughts, and especially how they see uh, in terms of their work uh, in aligning with the demand and delivering for real impact on the ground. That's, that's uh, what the emphasis of the new CGIR strategy is. So it will be really great to also for you to hear the perspective of this uh, new leadership team. Um, with that, let me first um, invite uh, Juan Lucas to come in. Uh, Juan Lucas. Uh, yes, uh, thanks, uh, Kundavi, and, and it's great to be here today. L let me start by saying that two years ago, around two years ago, I was brought as the director of to help build an alliance of Biodiversity International and SEAT. So it's two CG centers that 
are already involved in a very complex and uh, fruitful and successful uh, change uh, process. Uh, Marco Ferroni uh, called us trailblazers at some point in relation to CGIR reform. So we are uh, now you know, addressing and, and engaged in this new change, larger change. But from our experience, what I wanted to convey is that there is there are very clear benefits in the CGIR uh, process. And of course, uh, from the Alliance, we are sharing uh, all of our knowledge, experiences, etc., to help and put our, our five cents into this uh, larger and very important effort. Now on the function uh, as Global uh, Director of Partnerships and Advocacy, it's a, it's a very exciting, very strategic uh, uh, role where uh, I've been discussing with you, uh, Kundavi, uh, I see, you know, we've done a lot uh, in the decades of CGIR, but it's an area where CGIR needs to really raise uh, its level and improve uh, its performance. We need to partner up and to partner much better uh, with all kinds of organizations, but especially functionally with organizations in the global uh, south. Our current relationship with NARES, with uh, academia, national public research institutes, etc., is not necessarily at the appropriate level in terms of sharing uh, and, and uh, outcomes and uh, joining uh, efforts uh, for, uh, for research and for innovation, etc. So it's an area where we really need to level uh, up uh, our game. And this is a, a directorate that's uh, fully ready to, to support that. The function is also about uh, positioning uh, and making sure CGIR uh, is a clearly seen and a, and a, a much stronger actor in high level platforms, in, in, in high policy uh, dialogues. So we are more influential and by being more influential, it's just helping our strategy, our outcomes uh, and, and bringing more impact and, and scale, at scale. And finally, it's about uh, helping CGIR connect better the market, demand, the, the, the new mechanism, sustainable finance, et cetera, with, what, uh, with the supply from knowledge, from technology, IP, et cetera, that CGIR has. So it's helping also bridge uh, that uh, demand uh, uh, with, with supply. Uh, and for that, of course, over time, we need CGIR to develop a much more robust market uh, intelligence. So the function uh, needs to bring together uh, with a PA a view research a, the regional groups and make sure every individual in CGIR understands culturally that he or she has a role in terms of partnerships and advocacy. This is not a mandate of one area, but this is something that is spread across all of our community. Over to you, Kundavi. Thank you very much, Juan Lucas. This engagement with the National Agriculture Research System is one that we really need to take this very seriously. So it, it's not the importance of engaging with the National Agriculture Research System, but how, and uh, really deepening in everything that we do. Uh, so I'm really uh, pleased to, uh, to inform you all that there is a, a, a small team that is working on it. Now, Juan Lucas, Andre from the Resource Mobilization Communication Advocacy team, uh, together uh, bring some external expertise to really think through it. Uh, we wanna see how this is embedded in the initiatives, uh, but beyond that, so that it is uh, systematically and also uh, structurally how we bring national agriculture research system uh, part of our work as well. Something that uh, many of our stakeholders, the funders, the center boards, the countries, uh, which are represented in the uh, system council have all really been asking for. So in that sense, I, I hope um, uh, the work that we are doing will be able to bring back uh, to one of these uh, sessions and be able to share with you in the coming months. Uh, with that, let me now invite Ali. Uh, okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Kondavi, for the opportunity to address uh, colleagues on uh, this uh, very important uh, subject. Um, I am the uh, ICARDA Director General 
uh, of which the home has uh, naturally been the Suwana region. And I'm now uh, the uh, regional director in charge of uh, Siwan. Uh, Siwana is, is quite unique in the sense that it is among the hardest hit parts of the world in terms of climate change. So you see rising temperatures, um, uh, more uh, water scarce situations across many of the countries. You also see climate variability, not just change. And then uh, all of this is also combined with conflict and social unrest plus very difficult economic situation. So uh, on the ground, um, uh, what ICARTA has been able to do is to combine and support these countries over the years. So now with one CG, you have the whole capacity from across the system coming together. Uh, so uh, con uh, consolidating this scientific expertise and knowledge and 50 years of innovations and making this available globally is a huge step that was needed and coming on time, simply because the way the CG has been organized for the past is not necessarily fit to be able to deal with problems of the future. So by consolidating uh, you know, the, the capacity across the system, I strongly believe that the 1CG is now well positioned to deal with the challenges uh, of the future. So as uh, the uh, uh, initiatives uh, are being designed, and as we now have a 1CG research strategy for 2030, uh, one of the most critical roles of the regional directors is uh, and will be in ensuring how do we align the research and innovation work that we do uh, in different parts uh, of the world, uh, in this particular case in Siwana, with the needs and the priorities and the demand in each uh, country. Uh, so in, uh, uh, while the initiative design teams uh, are busy uh, preparing their initiatives, uh, it will be our top priority uh, within the regional uh, teams, uh, together with my colleagues, uh, to uh, uh, engage with the NARS partners, with the local research institutes, with the NGOs, with the private sector, uh, with the governments, with everyone, to see how do we bring in that perspective from the region into the design process so that at the end we are able uh, to design something that responds to the challenges uh, of the region uh, the best way uh, we can. And I strongly believe that uh, the way we are organized under 1CG, we are and should be able to do that in a way that has never done before over the past uh, 50 years. So one clear example, Kondavia, uh, uh, I'd like to share with colleagues is that tomorrow we will be organizing uh, the first uh, regional director consultations within the Siwana region. We have uh, close to 100 uh, people uh, you know, lined up uh, to attend and strong participation from different countries. And of course, uh, NARS colleagues. And, and we will have an opportunity re to remind them of the transition process into the one CG, how centers, and research capacity from across the system will come together and be able to work with each of the NAS partners in a different way, in a much more focused and in a way much greater than what we have done in the past. And then also explain what will be the prospectus of initiatives that are coming. We will of course focus on Siwana, but we will also explain that there is going to be another uh, process that will follow to engage with the countries that are going to be affected by the uh, uh, specific uh, initiative themselves. It's very important that we tap in and uh, take on board the knowledge in the region, the indigenous knowledge, the knowledge of the partners and their ability to operate on the ground under extremely difficult conditions to supplement and complement the strong scientific capacity and the partnerships we have in particular with advanced research institutes to be able to better serve uh, the region and the countries uh, that are, are, are uh, our clients in a way that is much stronger, much better than what we have done in the past. Thank you. Let Thank me you. stop here in the interest of time. Uh, really very good. Um, Ali, uh, this uh, engagement that you have organized tomorrow with the, the Savannah group is going to really give us an exciting opportunity to directly engage with the, uh, the key players, the National Agriculture Research System, the partners there. It's the kind of thing we also want to do in every region. This is the first time the EMT, the regional director, and the global science directors and the partnership director will be 
uh, engaged in different segments of this uh, big uh, event that uh, Ali has uh, put together. It's a kind of thing that we really can bring together the value proposition of the regional directors, helping bring that uh, engagement very strong, strongly on the ground and to align to the priorities and needs of the countries and the region. Uh, let me now um, invite uh, Harold um, to come in, please. Thank you very much, um, Kundavi, and hello, every one of you colleagues. Um, um, these are exciting times, and um, I would just like to um, remind colleagues who've been in the CG for the past eight, seven, seven to eight years, um, that when we were de developing the phase two CRPs, if you remember well, we had learned some lessons and we're talking about um, the way um, research and innovation delivered by the CGI could, in, could create impact in countries and would also support the priority needs of countries and also their circumstances. Um, after having finished um, developing the, um, the second phase therapies, we thought that this would happen, but we all knew what happened. It was quite difficult. And then um, we were, we had challenges with um, creating impacts. Obviously, as Martin said, there were some impacts, but we could have done more. So um, this, um, the G, the Global Engagement and Innovation Division is, I think, a very, very um, relevant element of the strategy and also of the structure. And I'm really excited to be part of the um, team of research and the regional directors who are at the forefront of this transformation who are helping to leverage all the capabilities of CGIR at country and regional levels to deliver greater impact, which obviously in itself is a great challenge. Um, Ali has mentioned something about um, some of the critical roles that we'll play. And I think one of the most important ones would be aligning our research and innovation work with demand. I do strongly agree with him. And our teams, the re regional directors and our teams will be the channel through which the needs and priorities on the ground can be understood. It has to be understood. I think that was one of the problems we, we had before. And it is through this that we can align our research agenda with these, um, um, these um, needs and priorities. Another important critical role that I see here for research um, re regional directors would be to ensure a wider engagement and consultation with country and regional partners to understand demand. And in addition to this, we would need to support the immediate IDT engagement that's ongoing. Um, Ali has mentioned this. So the regional directors and the country teams will be responsible for leading this continued dialogue with countries on their needs and priorities so that we can ensure the whole CGIAR agenda is shipped to meet these needs and priorities. Obviously, we're talking here about the both the pooled and non-pooled funding. So we, um, as regional directors, and I would add the country directors because we're talking about them, Kundari just mentioned them. When they are appointed, we'll be leading these discussions and in particular, leading the process of developing the regional and country frameworks that will set out the priority areas of activity for CGIR in and with our partner countries. Another critical area that I think would have to involve ourselves in is connecting with existing center regional and country staff. This is very important. And um, Elwin mentioned that um, the process of affiliation is very important. And he mentioned that one of the the, um, the, the reasons for doing this affiliation is to facilitate 
um, the way we would engage with um, our regional and country staff. And I believe that this is very, very important. So we're looking forward to engaging with those of you who are already leading, obviously, the excellent work in our countries to ensure that we build on what is already been done and coordinate well with you all to ensure good stewardship of all our critical relationship. So um, as a, a member of this team, I'll be looking forward to working with all of you as we try to deliver um, the great work of the CGR in terms of research and innovation. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Harold. That was extremely uh, helpful to really illustrate how the region directors can bring the demand side. I also wanted to share with you all colleagues, um, later today we will have the regional directors and the science directors, uh, global science directors and the partnership and advocacy global director coming together uh, to really look through how do we uh, enhance this engagement part. We have uh, from the regional directors, they have prepared a pra practical guidance and support for initiating design, uh, the IDTs uh, for engaging with stakeholders um, so that we can align with the development uh, and bring the demand side of it, and also how we can uh, partner with the, the local, uh, regional, and global level partners uh, to really scale up our impact as well. So the discussion will also help how would we try and do the sort of a supporting each other and the areas that we are looking at, how do we sort of uh, uh, aspects relating to the diagnostics of the supply, demand, and feasibility side that the IDTs can uh, take carefully look at. And then on the dialogue side, um, who are the key demand partners and scaling up partners uh, to verify the need and uh, to shape the priorities within that context of uh, supply uh, and uh, feasibility and the market there so that we can really be an impactful one CG. So that's a, a very good conversation that has already started that um, the managing director for science and impact and myself will be very much involved as part of the process to make this new model of one CGIR really take off in a strong way. Now, uh, let me now invite um, our next uh, regional director, John Bali. John? Yes, thank you, Kundavi, struggling with the uh, unmute button. Uh, thanks again. Thank you for giving me the, the opportunity to share a few thoughts and, and the message with, with our colleagues. Uh, uh, just a, a couple of points I would like to make to build on what Juan Juan Lucas Ali and Aaron have already uh, shared. Uh, the, the, the first point is perhaps to say that I am I am really excited about the the role of uh, our regional groups uh, in in you know their role in helping to uh, position the 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 one CGIR as the preferred and uh, partner, the trusted partner of governments and all uh, of the stakeholders in in each regions and country. And, and the, the opportunity of doing that by building on the clear comparative advantage, uh, you know, that the CGIR has in providing evidence for, for profound, inclusive and sustainable uh, food, um, land, water uh, system transformation. So I think this is a very strong point. We, we have a very competitive landscape in regions with many big organizations trying to become the preferred partners. And, and the challenge is exactly that. Make sure that we, we use our comparative advantage to, to be the preferred one uh, for very good reasons. In, in, in Southeast Asia and the Pacific, the region I will be intimately responsible for um, after the, the, you know, the interim in South Asia, the, the goal is really to become, for example, the, the, the ASEAN uh, preferred interlocutor and, and, and all the other countries in rep that are rapidly transforming uh, in this large region to actually make sure that we, the, 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 the immediate, the immediate, you know, uh, uh, partner that comes to their mind is the one CGIR. So, so in, I believe that the regional groups are uniquely positioned to, to understand these needs and ed elicit effective demands from partners, uh, harness the local dynamics and, and, and the very uh, specific country-led processes, uh, very often policy processes, uh, and 
And I believe that, that uh, all, all that can help to strengthen the, 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 the very important value proposition for the one CGIR in each region, because it is, or will be, very soon will be tailored to the, to the reality, to the context that, uh, that we, we, we are, we are uh, best placed to, to comprehend. So, so picking up on what um, um, Ali and Arul uh, just mentioned on supporting engagement, I, I think it is important to, to really understand that our, our regional director role in our respective regions is not only to ensure that our research agenda meets uh, uh, with demand, but also to, to develop a very fruitful dialogue. I think as you were saying, Kundavi, that again builds on on the comparative advantages of the one CGIR. And this dialogue is, is really this, this matching between the supply and demand side where, where, we, we, we are, where the ultimate vision is that we would become so valuable to countries uh, in supporting their own priorities that they, they will be willing to invest, uh, co-invest, uh, put their own resources uh, in, in, in support for, of our program of work to transform uh, these food, land, and water systems. So really invest in the one CGIR and beyond. Uh, and I think that the next step when we will be talking about the country and, and regional strategic frameworks, uh, these, these um, programmatic elements will be key uh, in achieving that ambition. The last point I wanted to make is probably that we, we, we are all very aware that if we have six regions is for a very good reason, the context in each region is uh, different. So while we will be working uh, closely with, with, with the other regional directors, with, with uh, the other global directors uh, in, uh, in the global engagement, innovation and science directors to, to have a very uh, consistent uh, approach across all regions uh, uh, to help uh, our colleagues. We also are equally uh, conscious that, we, 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 that the execution of these programs need to be tailored to the, to the local context and reality. So this, I think, is very important to actually uh, make sure that we, we understand that these, these two critical steps, you know, developing clear, clear and consistent frameworks, but at the same time, adjust as we implement and make sure that we monitor the implementation uh, and the progress to, to make sure that we can course correct uh, as needed to always align with uh, expectations from our partners. Uh, to make sure that we match these kind of uh, uh, specific needs. Thank you. I will stop here for the moment. Thank you very much, uh, Jean. Uh, very important in terms of uh, country-led processes. And uh, uh, colleagues, if you see, that's one of the things that we are thinking about having a, a country strategic framework or regional framework that actually uh, is uh, developed by the country directors, country managers, if whatever we are going to call them and at the regional level, the regional directors will be developing. That actually will be done in a much more consultative way involving all the country players so that uh, we understand uh, the country context, uh, the local context, and then develop the priorities and needs. And it is also, it's not about 1CG uh, bringing our own research and innovation and science, but there is also a lot going on in the country. So uh, getting those aspects uh, to, to develop under the country strategy framework is something that we are uh, looking at. There is a transition task team that are, are being put, have been put in place that is working closely with the regional directors in number of these uh, products that we are working on. So we can get um, the staff thinking as well in as we, uh, develop these uh, instruments uh, moving forward so that we can also be more consistent, coherent, capturing some of the good ideas coming from the teams that are on the ground. So that's a, a good set of work that has um, already started with the regional directors uh, who come on board. Um, let me finally ask um, Sanginga, who can come in at this point. Sanginga. Go ahead, Sanginga. Okay. Uh, thank you, Kundavi. And uh, yeah, good afternoon to all colleagues. Um, yes, I um, lead ITA for uh, the last uh, past 10 years. And uh, probably I'm going to share my experience. 
So I'm um, the regional director of um, Western Central Africa that has 27 countries divided into Anglophone, uh, Francophone, and uh, Lusophone. In this area, investment in research by uh, the head of state or by the countries themselves is almost zero. So it would be naive to believe that um, um, the CG alone uh, can invest and make, making sure that uh, the research produces the impact that uh, we all expect in all those countries. So our role will be basically to convince the policymakers, and especially the head of state and the minister of finances to invest in agriculture. A big task. I'm not talking even about the Minister of Agriculture because the Minister of Agriculture is to do the same job as we do to convince those two people. So I'm going to share uh, my experience with that. And I believe our role as a regional di director will be really exactly to convince uh, those um, policymakers uh, to start investing in the countries. So I'll give you an example of uh, what happened uh, to ACSICA for the last past, um, uh, yeah, the first three years, four years, where every time when I went to the Minister of Agriculture, and I had the chance to meet with the President as well, for three years I was talking about research. And while talking about research, I was looking uh, for contribution from the Nigerian government. And for three years, they won't give that contribution. And I was asking myself, why? Uh, because uh, then uh, the Minister of Agriculture said, well, well, we haven't seen the, the kind of impact ITA has um, made in this country until the time, because we're not communicating very well, we're doing very good research on cassava bread here, until the time we went and presented the result of cassava bread and so showing the products. Uh, from that day, the president invited me to be in this committee of uh, economics um, uh, restoration in Nigeria. And from that period, the government of Nigeria started investing money into IITA until uh, today. Uh, the example of just the last past month in Congo, Brazzaville, uh, speak to the same, where uh, the president of Congo was going to Brazil, uh, to Brazil to look for uh, support, research support uh, and innovation from Ambrapa until um, the president of ADB indicated to him that, uh, well, we have the CG and IT can come and help. So I went to Brazzaville with uh, the team of ADB and uh, we met with the president for one hour and a half and we explained what we could do. Uh, basically, he was convinced uh, with uh, the example of uh, scaling up technologies uh, coming from research that, well, um, IT and I would say uh, the, the CG basically could uh, play that role of uh, technical assistance uh, to his country. And in one month, ADB and uh, the Congo uh, basically prepare a project of $31 million that we're going to lead for um, uh, the next coming five years. And there I see, and a good example uh, will be of success, will be to try to see when the African countries start investing in research and innovation through the loan taking from uh, the World Bank or Africa Development Bank, Islamic Development Bank. That for me is going to be a proof that the research we are doing is reproducing impact, which is being bought by uh, um, uh, the country in which we want to work. I would like to finish by saying um, uh, that we see the benefits of the one CG system in analyzing the project like the touch tool funded by the, 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 by the African Development Bank where we do have 11 CG centers working that project, and we have to sign agreement with each of the CG centers, sister center. I think, and it's really painful. And we see uh, really as uh, one CG system, uh, basically I'm not sure they won't have the need to sign 11 agreement because they want to be speaking with one voice. And uh, I see that uh, as a benefit among others. So uh, really um, excited 
I am and we are uh, to be part uh, of this team. And again, uh, basically we have to work very, uh, very hard at the demand and I hope our colleagues um, in the term of supply, uh, the group, the science group uh, will understand that doing research for research sake is not going to help the countries and is not going to help the one CG. So the arm of delivery has to be very, very strong. And I presume that uh, arm will be uh, basically facilitated, facilitated by the country directors and the regional directors. Thank you, Kondavi. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sanginga. That's a very uh, good practical case, uh, how we can take a specific demand and uh, really bring that innovation bundling that we're always talking about, the policy science, the capacity and bringing the uh, the funding of uh, IFIs to really scale up the way we uh, respond to our uh, needs of our countries is a very good one and that's where we see the regional directors and science directors really working together. Um, I think with that we are uh, almost um, uh, finished all from the global uh, engagement and innovation team. There were there are a couple of questions come here, and I want to take uh, this opportunity to quickly respond to them and uh, hand this over to um, Claudia. Uh, there was one on could the EMT update on financial commitments by key funders? Again, a very important one. Money is in everybody's mind. Uh, are we really able to uh, transition uh, strongly? And and please to share with your colleagues that we had the system council meeting that concluded recently and where there was a very uh, clear commitment from our funders. Uh, first, they really supported the uh, RMCA strategy of the uh, one CJR team and very supportive of the um, approaches that we have taken, the, the, the five action areas through which we would be scaling up and uh, delivering on this 1 billion target. Uh, by 2030 annually, that is very much uh, a part of the agenda and supported by the funders. But the more important one that I'm very pleased is that, that um, there was a, a strong and steady support for, from system council funders to pool funding. And there were uh, the funder champions. Uh, this is a group of funders who work very closely with us on our ambition for scaling up and uh, increasing our resources they have put forth some very key preferential principles, as they called it, that uh, system council funders should be putting more in the pooled funding, uh, more in the window one and window two, multiple year of funding, and also bringing it all together and uh, using one of these global events as a pledging moment. Um, Gates is expected to at least put 50% of their funding through pooled funding in 2022, and we expect that to increase to up to 70%. Similarly, um, a number of uh, funders, uh, Netherlands, Switzerland, uh, Canada, EC, Belgium, Ireland, Sweden, number of our bilaterals, uh, particularly in the European countries are um, increasing the pool funding. And we also uh, hoping that uh, with the greater uh, effort from our side on the bilateral side, let me emphasize again, this does not mean uh, we take our eye off the ball on the bilateral funding. So there is an initiative currently underway to build that one CG pipeline so that we really can advance and deepen our bilateral funding sources that you have already been working at. So let's ensure that that is also being um, uh, closely uh, you know, uh, supported and strengthened from all of your work as well. So together, we, we feel that um, the, with the funder commitment, we should be able to transition uh, with a very smooth initiatives uh, being funded from the pooled funding. There was also another question on what's the timeline for the CG uh, rebranding and will it happen? Again, just wanted to emphasize um, this uh, rebranding process started some time back. There is a consultancy team that is working closely with a group that we have internally set up that's looking at the design and advancing on how will be uh, in, in the renaming of the 1CGAR. Uh, already a survey has been put forth and thanks to you all for putting your suggestions in there. We are in the process of uh, shortlisting and we'll come back to you with the further consultation before we can uh, finalize this. Again, on the timeline that you asked, we expect something on the launch of it 
early in 2022. We have so much work on the funding aspects and a number of other things on the transition agenda. So the rebranding uh, launch will only happen sometimes early next year. So that's the timeline. And uh, let me uh, now turn it over to Claudia. There was some question on uh, uh, CG as uh, one of the arm of the uh, Rome-based agency uh, at the global level. Claudia, maybe you can uh, take that on. Back to you. Great. Well, thank you, Kundavi, and thanks everyone for uh, this last set of uh, discussions and introductions. It's just very exciting to see people coming into place and the vision really taking hold. Um, this question about Rome is, a, is an interesting one. And, you know, there's been a discussion actually for a couple of years now in the CG about really establishing CG as the fourth Rome-based agency, the Rome-based agency that focuses on applied research and becomes really the policy science interface. And we are looking very much forward to having a clear established global presence within Rome and uh, really, really claiming CGIR space as a, as a global food and agriculture agency um, in, in Rome. So it's great to see that, that sort of the same ideas coming up and out of these discussions. Um, we have a few moments left and there were uh, many, many important questions that are being asked, but I'd like to take two in particular and turn back to um, Elwyn uh, to, to speak. Um, one importantly is asking about the diversity in the remaining senior appointments and our, our process and our, uh, our aspirations in that regard. And the second is really a question around what the post-COVID world will look like. How will we adapt as we all return to offices and uh, how, will, how will that affect the, uh, the running of CGIR? So may I turn now to Elvin, please? Thank you, uh, Claudia. Yeah, on the first question around diversity in recruitment, um, this is incredibly important. Many forms of diversity, as I mentioned, we've got to have a leadership that reflects the world as it is. Um, you recall that I mentioned there are three phases to the recruitment process. The first phase was to for the, uh, the DGs to be um, allocated you know, really important leadership roles in the new structure. Um, the second phase was to fill the remaining regional and global directors. And the third um, was to uh, recruit for senior directors. Obviously, with the DGs, um, we, there was an existing profile um, where it wasn't, it's not a, it, it by no means met the gender diversity targets in terms of the ratio of women DGs. So we're working really hard for the remaining positions, the remaining uh, global directors, the remaining regional directors, uh, and particularly the well, including the senior directors, to, to be more diverse um, so that we can meet the 40% target for women in those key overall leadership group um, to, to meet the 40% target is so important and, and in future to go to, 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 to surpass that. So it's really important. I hope you can see from the profile of our system board, from the profile of EMT, that we do take this really seriously. The second point on the uh, post-COVID world is, is, a, is a great question. Um, uh, and it's, you know, th there's a number of lines to the response. Um, to, to be brief, um, I think we are, um, what's come through very clearly today and the great interventions from my colleagues is how we need um, an operational structure that enables us to deal with complex interrelated um, uh, research uh, challenges of which pandemics are, are, are a classic example and the One Health is a classic example. So the structure enables that. But there's the, then there's the broader question of, of to what extent is our business model suited to a post-COVID world um, where there we can anticipate, unfortunately, this problem continuing around COVID for some time and there will be future pandemics. So a couple of quick points. First, um, the, the, the new structure we're building with country managers, regional directors, should really help us and, 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 and excuse me, in a global, um, a global integrated security uh, response, where as part of the operational structure, we're anticipating a, a global security unit that can help coordinate um, our work around this area, obviously with really important local actions taking place. We anticipate that, that, that structure being 
enable swift and decisive responses to these kind of issues. Secondly, a number of centers already changed their working practices. We've all made a huge change on, on the notion of remote working. I'm, I'm fully anticipating that to be a core part of the new HR policy and framework and to be reflected well within that. Thirdly, um, with a global one CGR with common HR policies and, and, and a common approach to contracting, there is the opportunity for um, more um, staff mobility across countries as and, as and when, when we need that. So that is another mm -hmm. potential line of our, of our response. So there's a number of ways in which you know, we, we see this um, helping us having a, a, an integrated IT function for the whole of CGIR could enable us to uh, be able to invest more in the kind of technologies that enable and smooth the way for the kind of re fluid remote working that, that we're used to. And my last point is that I don't think we've yet completed this discussion. I think we're all reconciling with what this means for working practices, to what extent we, um, we separate ourselves from the notion of fixed offices. A number of us are looking forward to going back to, to office spaces, a number are quite content with this way of working. So there's an ongoing discussion, I think, happening across uh, CGR about you know, what, what, what does normal look like after this? And it will certainly not be the same as before. And I think we haven't finished that discussion. Back to you, Claudia. Thanks so much, Owen. And I think um, this final point that you were really coming to about the way in which these global systems can really strengthen us. Um, is so important and it, and it runs across all three of our divisions. So clearly the institutional systems can be much more integrated, effective and, uh, and we hope strengthening. With regard to the science, you know, I mentioned earlier that scientists may be mapped in one place, but they can work on various initiatives. And something that's just very exciting about the new structure is the globality of that opportunity, working across any space in the whole one CGR portfolio for scientists. And I think we're seeing that same globality in the discussion of global engagement and innovation when we're talking with our regional directors and the way in which these more universal relationships, these global relationships that we can have with our partners, how we can build those regional partnerships, those dialogues, those, uh, those, those stakeholder connections and partnerships, and we can bring all of 1CG and all of our global learning and capacities to those partnerships. So this globality is uh, really at the heart of uh, what we're trying to achieve with the one CGR reforms. But we have come now to the point in our session, uh, as always, where there's still so much more to discuss, but we're coming to the, the end of our time together. So uh, we'll be taking one final poll. And uh, before we do, let me just remind everyone that uh, of the CGR Pulse survey that we circulated on the 21st of June, and it remains open until this Friday, the 9th of July. So please do complete the survey if you haven't done so already. It's important, it's an important tool for us to continuously improve the transition and to focus on the issues that uh, are most important to all of you. And speaking of that, we'll turn to our final poll if we can put up the Menti slide. And as we always do, um, we would like to ask you again, uh, moving forward um, with a view to these future webinars and communications on the transition, what is it that you would like to hear more about? So I want to thank everyone very much. And as we begin to share the results uh, on the screen, you'll see uh, again in the Q&A or in the chat, uh, we've put up the survey link for those of you who haven't had an opportunity to respond to the survey. Um, but now for the Menti link, we'll put this up on the screen. And thank you all for attending this webinar. A uh, great conversation as always. Excellent questions, tremendously valuable to us. Uh, following this, you will be receiving a short survey to provide your feedback as well uh, to help us update on communications. And as a reminder, uh, a recording of this session will be made available on CGIR.org in the coming days. Please do share it with any colleagues who were unable to uh, attend. And we're seeing, as always, a, a great set of issues that we will continue to work on moving forward. Um, our science, our funding, our capacity development, communications, great to see diversity, culture, transparency, 
These are all issues that we're working on in a very focused way. We do have a CGR culture initiative that is uh, quite, quite focused on ensuring that we're building alongside our structures and our policies and our programming, a CGR culture that is really global and inclusive and engaged. A great, great set of issues. Delighted to see them. I want to uh, extend a special thanks to all of our CGR leadership, all of our science and uh, regional and partnership directors who spoke with us today, who shared just the range of, uh, of exciting visions for what lies ahead. And thank you, all of you, wherever you are in the world, whatever time it happens to be, for joining us again, and I look forward to the next time we have an opportunity to get together. So thank you all, and goodbye until next time. Take care.